Hi, I'm attorney Gregory Dell, joined today by attorney Alexander Palomara, and we're going to discuss long-term disability insurance claims and what is a disability carrier required to give you when you request a claim file. And Alex, obviously when we're talking about a disability claim file, we're talking about claims governed by ERISA, which is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, and that has a whole set of regulations of which we've done tons of videos about. And when a claim is governed by ERISA, there's a requirement to provide a claim file once a claim has been denied. So I want to talk about in this video about the important things that are required to be in a claim file from the disability insurance company and the important documents that you're always looking for when you're preparing appeals for clients. So right off the bat, first of all, when you request a claim file, how do you go about doing that process and what specifically are you asking for? You know, when a person hires us to represent them, the first thing we do is send out a letter of representation and we, rep and, and that, we obviously tell the insurance company that we're so-and-so representing this new client of ours and we request a, the entire copy of the claim file. We probably request more things than, we, than are allowed under the ERISA laws but we request as much as we can, so the insurance company has to provide us with every uh, piece of information that ERISA requires them to apply to, to send to us, so that we can review it prior to filing the appeal for our claim for our, for our client. So the type of information that we are requesting, obviously, is all the internal, what's known as SOAP notes, that the insurance company um, has to put in the claim file, uh, copies of the different reviews, whether it's internal reviews conducted by you know, nurses over there at the insurance company, whether it's Mace Kettle, um, uh, uh, medical case manager uh, reviews, whether it's doctor reviews, independent doctor reviews, internal doctor reviews, or whatever it is, we need to get our hands on these documents before we can actually file the appeal to know why our client's claim is either strong or weak or what we have to you know, fix for our client before we file that appeal. So what's very unique about ERISA, we always talk about the pros and cons of ERISA versus a claim that's not governed by ERISA and the employer provided policies are the ones that are governed by ERISA but what's unique in ERISA and sometimes I think this is an advantage is the ability to get what's called the claim file which then becomes what's also known as the administrative record is the fact that you don't have to go through this whole discovery process you don't have to do requests for interrogatories you don't have to do requests for production the insurance company has an obligation to basically give you every single document that they possibly looked at or considered or even had in their possession which is related to the disability claim and Alex you know from having litigated thousands of cases that's a unique um, area of the law the fact that a company is required to just give you all of their information without you having to ask for it and also Alex without having to pay for it which is interesting as well Correct. I mean, the one good thing, ERISA does, for lack of a better term, ERISA does stink a lot of the times for claimants. I mean, it really puts the claimant you know, behind the eight ball. It's hard to win an ERISA lawsuit. But the one good thing about ERISA, like you're saying, is that you get a copy of this claim file. So there's no secrets. There should be no secrets. Why the, the insurance company rendered their decision the way they did and what information they're relying upon, they have to provide that to you. So there's no secrets here. And they have, but the only thing is they don't have to provide it to you until they deny your claim. So if, let's just say they send you an independent medical examination and, you want, and, you're, and they're paying your claim right now or maybe it's an application to have not yet rendered a decision on your claim, they do not have to send you that document until they deny your claim. But once they deny your claim, before you file the appeal, you have every right to every uh, piece of information that they are relying upon to, de to deny your claim. So there's no secrets here. And it gives the claimant a, an advantage in this scenario in the sense that they can go and get all the reviews that the insurance company is relying upon to deny this claim. Look at all the internal soap notes. See the different emails back and forth sometimes that the insurance company sends to themselves. Um, see, you know, different, you know, the job analysis, you know, occupational analysis. And you can go in there and, and see all this information that they're relying upon and kind of poke holes in those reviews. And that's what you have to do with an appeal. Because for some reason, the insurance company, if you're a disabled person, the insurance company is denying your claim. Something's gone on, something's gone wrong here, of course. Either the, your, your medical records are not strong enough or the reviews they're relying upon are faulty and you have to poke holes in those, in those reviews. And that's, that's key to a disability insurance appeal. Or let's just say your appeal gets denied. Before you file the lawsuit, you need to know how, how strong your lawsuit may be. I mean, you're going to file the lawsuit no matter what because you, you know that you are right. But you need to know, that, you know the holes you might need to plug, arguments you need to make when you actually start litigating this case. So it's actually an advantage in this one scenario where, where ERISA actually helps uh, claimants. 
So Alex, I want to go through a checklist of items that should be in the claim file. So if you can walk us through each of those and, um, and then maybe I'll ask you some questions about some of those things. But for the person who's watching this video and they're considering handling their appeal on their own and they really want to make sure they're getting everything they're supposed to, what are those items generally that are supposed to be in every single claim file? All right, for sure, there's going to be the, like I keep on referring to, the reviews that the insurance company is relying upon. So they might go out and have their own doctors perform reviews, and they have doctors on staff and nurses on staff. And a lot of times when they're lazy, they only use the, the on-staff people to perform the reviews of your medical records. Um, but it, sometimes they go out and hire what's known as quote-unquote independent physician consultants, where they go out and hire a company and say, hey, I need a neurologist to perform a review of these medical records or a hematologist or whatever it may be. And they might actually have this independent person perform a review, but these independent people, more often than not, are just doing reviews all day or a couple of days a week or maybe a one, week, one day out of the week, and they just devote to doing reviews for, for insurance companies and get paid a, probably a pretty hefty hourly rate of doing it. Um, but the, the reviews are going to be in there. The one thing that has to be in there is the medical documentation that you submitted or your treating provider submitted. If you go through the claim file and say, hey, listen, I faxed these people 50 pages of medical records or 150 pages of medical records and I, and I, I FedEx it to them as well, and you go through your claim file and it's not in there, you know something's going on wrong. Um, but anything that you send in, your doctors send in, or anything that you've sent in to support your claim, whether it's medical records, letters of support from your treating providers, letters of support from your um, family and friends, or maybe a personal impact statement, if you know that you've submitted it in there, you have a fax confirmation, for some reason is not in that file, then something's going on here and they either, they either never got it, they lost information, which is oftentimes, you know, they're big insurance companies, they can very often lose information because they're, they're too big for themselves. But if documentation that you've submitted and you can prove that you submitted is not in there, something's gone wrong here. So, but medical documentation that you've submitted, any support that you've submitted should be in there. The medical reviews that they utilize should be in there. Uh, more often than not, the policy, the governing policy that's going to be governing your claim should be in there. Like, like I mentioned earlier, the SOAP notes. So there's a lot of you know, internal notes. Sometimes there's a list of phone calls and emails they sent out or just internal notes that, that the different people that have touched your case you'll see notes in there. You know, there's, there's many hands, unfortunately, that are going to touch your case when you file a claim for disability insurance benefit, whether it's the claims examiner, their supervisor, you know, a nurse, um, medical case manager, whoever it may be, they're all going to take a look at different aspects of your claim and put notes in there and make recommendations and make more recommendations, say, oh, I don't see this in here or I see this in here. And sometimes you can find one person at the insurance company who's very supportive of your claim and says, this person is disabled, the next person disagrees, and then a third person is the tiebreaker and they deny your claim. But if you don't know to look in those soap notes to find these little sentences here or there that can be very supportive, saying, listen, look at, look at this nurse that reviewed the claim for you guys back in April. Now in May, you said that I'm not disabled, but in April, that person said I was totally disabled and you can call them out on their for lack of a better term BS you know because um, I find more often than not they want to deny claims and approve claims sadly and if you find these little these little nuggets in there it could go very far in helping prove your claim if your claim has been denied or even with your lawsuit by proving the insurance company or proving to the judge that you are disabled remain disabled and should be paid benefits and then I think some of the other items since you, you already mentioned a lot but um Obviously, all the claim forms that have been submitted, the initial applications, if you've been on claim for a while, all of the claimant statements, the attending physician statements, the, um, if the carrier has sent you um, vocational paperwork to fill out where they ask for your work history, your educational history, uh, any kind of documentation. Again, if they've interviewed you and there is a recording, there should be a transcript in there of that recording. There should be notes from that recording. And then Alex, another really oh, surveillance as well. Yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, if they do surveillance, surveillance has to be in there as well. You know, oftentimes they try to get away with not sending you the actual CD of the video of the surveillance. They just send you the reports, but you should always ask for the, the surveillance CD so you actually can see it. Because I've read reports of the surveillance where basically the, the person conducting the, um, the surveillance, you know, they mentioned one thing in their report, the written report, and you, then you watch the... Uh, the actual video and it kind of well it matches a little bit it doesn't match 100 percent and the words you know you, you know you might read the words like oh my gosh my client did this like oh oh geez you know and then you watch the surveillance actual video and you're like wait a minute that's not so bad um so you want to have the actual if you can get your hands on the actual video surveillance that's better than actually reviewing the actual reports but the surveillance has to be in there as well 
Yeah, absolutely. And any communications they've had with anybody and, and bills that they've paid, if they've hired outside doctors, those things should be in there. You mentioned surveillance. If they paid an investigator, the bills that they paid to that investigator should be in there. And also, I mean, you'll, you'll see, I mean, you'll see your Facebook page in there. They, they go online and they're, they're going to Google you. They're going to search you out. So you'll see your LinkedIn. If you're actively looking for a job, you'll see your Facebook, any other Instagram. So, I mean, sometimes it's best to make all those things private. So maybe only your friends can see it or, or very limited to who could actually see your Facebook page or, or um, social media page because they're going to go in there and they're gonna, everything that you put on your Facebook page, they're, they're going to utilize against you. You know, if you, if you put a, a picture looking happy at the ballpark, you know, and you're making a claim that you're disabled and they're like, look at this guy. He's sitting at the ballpark with his kids holding his, his child up in his arms with a beer in his other hand. I don't think this person looks disabled. So they're going to go on your Facebook page, and you, but you're going to see that in your claim file. So. Alex, I think you've given a, a great summary of all the items that are in the claim file, and that's obviously just the starting point when we go and sit down and we're going to write an appeal, is that you got to get that claim file, you got to break it out. Often it's a minimum of 500 pages, and I know we've had claim files going up to 15 or 20,000 pages of documentation, depending upon how long a claim has been going on. And Alex, you know that some disability carriers have a claim file organized, and those are the companies that tend to be more organized. And other disability companies just send you a pile of papers that have absolutely no organization. And that's a reflection on how that particular disability insurance company handles their claims. So you don't know what particular format you're going to get because it varies depending upon which company but the first thing you got to do is you got to go through that entire claim file use our video as a checklist make sure that everything you requested is in there and if it's not you have to immediately send another letter to the disability insurance company saying i didn't get this i didn't get that please send it to me because their failure to send that information is an example of them abusing their discretion if they have it or another simple way of saying is they acted unreasonably which can become a factor later on in litigation so you know if you have a claim and it's been denied we encourage you to contact us for a free initial consultation what we'll do is we'll review your denial letter we'll let you know right away how we can assist you and provide you with a plan of attack for moving forward we also encourage you to spend a little bit of time on our website and watch additional videos that we have like this where we offer claim tips for every type of long-term disability claim. We have specific information about your disability insurance company. You can also search by your occupation or search by your medical condition. You're going to find lots of reviews about your company. You're going to find summary of cases that we've handled and summaries of lawsuits that have happened all around the country. And while it sounds like you know it's a lot of information, it is a lot of information, but we want you to be educated about this process because the better educated you are, the better position you're going to be in to win your appeal and keep your benefits from being denied in the future. So we help clients all over the country and we look forward to the opportunity to speak with you should you need us in the future.